Welcome to Wingate Spotlight. I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science at Wingate University. I'm joined today by Patrick Young, Dr. Patrick Young, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Wingate University. Um, Patrick, you've been here now. This is the start of your second year. That's correct, yes. Um, tell us, uh, what we like to do on Wingate Spotlight is first get to know you a little bit personally and then the second half spend some more time talking about you professionally. So let's start from the beginning. Where are you from? Uh, where were you born? <clears throat> All right, well, I'm originally from California. I was born in Orange County. Um, most people know that from the OC TV show. Okay. So I uh, grew up there, went to school there, high school. Um, graduated high school, went up to Northern California to do my undergraduate work at Humboldt State, which is about 13 hours from Orange County, but still in California. So uh, went up there, did my, got my BA in psychology, uh, stayed in the area, um, got my master's degree there as well, and then headed out to Florida. But uh, yeah, originally from California. Okay. What, what was the decision to make the transition to, I guess what they call Northern California, but n more Northern <laughs> California? Um, well, I mean, I'll be, I'll be completely honest. I just wanted to get a, as far away from my parents as possible, but, <laughs> but still stay in California. Mm -hmm. um, that was the main attraction to it. Uh, Humboldt State's about an hour south of the Oregon border, so it's, first, it's pretty much up there. Uh, but still in California, still a little bit, it's right on the beach, um, but yet nestled in behind, uh, within the Redwood Forest. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a great location, very beautiful, but yet still close to the mountains to go, you know, skiing, snowboarding, beach, and then close enough to, say, San Francisco to still kind of be in touch with reality. So. Okay. Or the reality that is San Francisco. <laughs> yeah, is. exactly. Yeah. So. so do you identify as being a, kind of a California kid in a way? Uh, is California I mean, a very strong identification for you? It is for me because I think, I don't, I don't think I would meet the, the stereotype of, of someone from California. At least I hope not. Maybe I do. You could tell me if I do. Um, but at least as far as physically. But I think ideal-wise, I think I do because I'm, I'm pretty laid back. Um, I like to do outdoorsy types of things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so as far as that laid back kind of go with the flow, I think I represent that. But um, I, I didn't surf, so that's okay. so one thing that people usually ask me: Do you surf? No, never surfed. Uh, skateboard, snowboard, things like that, but mm -hmm. never, never got in the water much. Okay. So. And what about uh, sports affiliations? Did you have any sports teams uh, that you would have uh, feel, felt close to? Yeah, definitely. Um, very much in the sports. Uh, it's kind of. An interesting story how I have my, my favorite sports teams. Uh, growing, up, growing up in California, you'd think that I'd like you know the Dodgers, the Angels. Um, actually, back then we had the Raiders and the Rams uh, as well. Um, the only really California team that I die hard for is the Lakers. You know, um, definitely a Laker fan. Um, but other than that, my allegiance is started to the Cubs, Chicago Cubs. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up as a a product of my my cable environment watching WGN you know every day Cubs games on all the time so I really grew up with you know Ryan Sandberg and Andre Dawson and the Cubs and still definitely a Cubs fan um, and then the Broncos which is another kind of you know, why are you a Bronco fan well my family went to Colorado a lot for vacation mm -hmm. so grew up going to that state and then just kind of had an attraction to the Broncos and John Elway, and you know, my dog's named Elway now. So, um, so those are my teams. Uh, I root. I try to root for the California teams, um, with the exception of the Raiders, because I, I just don't like the Raiders. But um, every, all the other teams, I'll root for. But if you were to ask me my favorite teams, you know, Lakers, Cubs, Broncos, yeah. definitely. So growing up a Lakers fan, what what era would that have been? Uh, like, what what would your idols have been as a boy? Uh, Basketball-wise, well, Magic Johnson, obviously, sure. uh, Showtime Lakers, Pat Riley, um, you know, Byron Scott, Cooper, you know, the Koopa Loop. Yeah. Um, so those are the main guys, Worthy, obviously, uh, which people out here would know since he went to Carolina. But um, those are the big ones, um, you know, Magic for sure. Uh, and then now, Kobe. Sure. Yeah, even though that might be a little... <laughs> controversial. I know people don't like Kobe, but hey, he's a great player and I can respect that. Sure, sure. Well, uh, you go to Humboldt State, you spend four or five years there? <laughs> Maybe a little longer? <laughs> yeah, um, took me, I, was a, I was a five-year student for my undergrad, okay. which was fine. I was in no hurry, you know. I guess technically I finished four and a half, but hung around another semester. 
Um, after that, I graduated. I loved the area. All my friends stayed there. Not a lot of jobs in that area. It's that the actual city's Arcata, which is small, bigger than Wingate, but small. Um, I was able to find a job there. Worked at the airport for United Express, so I got to, um, you know, have that experience of flying around for free and and you know, talking with people and you know, kind of working on my psychological skills in terms of dealing with people and communication and. Uh, resolving conflicts. That was good and it allowed me to see a lot of things and then um, ended up wanting to go back to school and went back to Humboldt for my master's degree for two years. And was your master's degree in psychology? Yes, also in psychology, research oriented. Um, and the reason for that was just because I wanted, I saw myself potentially being a teacher and um, I knew if I wanted to do that I'd have to get at least a master's if not a PhD. So that kind of got me in the door and then you know, I like research, which a lot of people don't, I realize, <laughs> firsthand that people don't, but that's fine, you know, and, and I like it, it's good, it's good for me, and it allowed me to get where I am now, which is important. Sure. To go from Northern California and Southern California, essentially a California kid, to Tallahassee, Florida, that's a culture shock. Definitely, definitely a culture that's, shock. So how did you get to, why, why Florida State, I guess, of the array of choices? Um, maybe? Well, you know, this wasn't really up to, up to me, you know, <laughs> I was looking at programs, PhD, pro, PhD programs in sports psychology, and there's not really a lot to choose from. A lot, of, a lot more master's programs and PhD. And the two that I found that really I thought were a good fit for me were, were or was Florida State and then uh, UNC Greensboro. So I applied to two schools, uh, got into Florida State, didn't get into Greensboro, and mm -hmm. that kind of made my decision for me. The rest is history. Yeah. How was your kind of personal experience in Tallahassee, I mean, socially and those kinds of attributes? Um, well, like you said, it, it culturally is a lot different, you know, coming to the South. Um, coming from Humboldt State, which was maybe pushing 7,500 students to Florida State, which is its own city, basically, you know, 35,000 undergraduates, uh, massive campus, um, you know, just different types of people. Um, it was, it was different. It took a little getting used to. Um, one of the things I assumed was, you know, it's Tallahassee, it's the capital of Florida. I'm, I'm thinking Sacramento or San Francisco <laughs> or some, you know, kind of vibrant, progressive perhaps city, but uh -huh. um, not the case at all. Uh, very, very small townish for a, for a capital and really not much of a downtown, uh, nothing compared to, you know, Charlotte. Um, so that was different getting used to. Uh, sports wise, it was great because, you know, Humboldt in Division Two, not much going on in sports. And then you come to, you know, the Seminoles who have the, the, the history, especially with, with football. Um, you know, it was a lot different going to a football game with, I would say, about 80 to 90,000 because they weren't really doing too hot then. Um, mm -hmm. But still, a lot of people and the whole tailgating culture and cornhole, and that was a lot different. So, um, it was fun. It was, you know, got to meet a lot of diverse people, and um, you know, it worked out for me because I met my wife there, so that's good. <laughs> okay, let, let, we'll come back to your wife in just a second. Um, did did you feel like you became a knoll when you were there? Like, did, did you take on that the identity of FSU? I think I did. Yeah, just primarily because you know, growing up, I played sports. I played baseball. I played soccer. I played basketball. Um, when I went to Humboldt, there just wasn't. It was a very, you know, it's. It's an alternative type of school, you know, it's kind of hippie-ish. Mm -hmm. um, sports really weren't an emphasis. You know, the football team was very small. People didn't go, I didn't go to one football game my entire mm -hmm. what, five, seven years I was there and enrolled. Um, went to maybe one basketball game. You know, the gym was like a high school gym. It was just, it just wasn't there. So going to Florida State, now it's, you have massive, you know, it's an institution of sport. It was a lot, a lot different, a lot more exciting, and, and yeah, I totally identify with that. I mean, I'm definitely a, a seminal, um, which sometimes is better than others. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, um, let's go back to Brooke, your wife. Mm -hmm. How did you meet her? Um, well, the first day of orientation for our sports psychology program, we met. Uh, we had, um, you know, an informal get together with faculty and then we went and had lunch and she just happened to be sitting next to me and we kind of hit it off and you know we had a lot of similar interests the sports psychology um, and it just you know it, was, it, was, it wasn't something that 
was immediate, but within a couple of months, you know, it started to really um, kind of take its course. Sure. And she obviously knows sports as well. She comes from a family that's very <laughs> identifiable, I guess. Yeah, you could say that. Um, her father is very well known in the sports community, especially here in, in Carolina. Sure. Um, so yeah, she she grew up an athlete. You know, she was uh, she ran track in high school and at UNC Asheville, uh, very athletic. Um, and with her dad being David Thompson, okay. um, you know, a well known if not the well best known basketball player you know in in Carolina. Um, yeah, she grew up around it, so she was used to it. She's used to the all the good and the bad, the celebrity, the expectations, and you know, it's it's. It definitely helped the relationship because you know me being a big sports fan, her, you know, being on the other side of it. Sure. Um, so yeah, and then obviously getting the chance to to not only meet David but then get to know him and now uh, be part of the family. It's it's been a great experience. A lot of lot of opportunities. Great. Well, you 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 mentioned it offhandedly, but your wife Brooke is from Charlotte. You get your PhD from Florida State, and almost instantly you're turning around and moving to Wingate, North Carolina. Yeah. Like, go through that whole experience. How does well, that happen? It definitely wasn't planned, I'll tell you that. Um, you know, both of us obviously went to Florida State, same program. Uh, I graduated in August of 2010, and she was scheduled to graduate that December. And, you know, getting ready for graduation, just applying to jobs everywhere, a lot in California, um, out west, basically anywhere, though, just because the state of the economy, you, gotta, you can't limit yourself to any one place. Mm -hmm. um, had a couple, excuse me, interviews here and there, a couple leads didn't work out, and right around the time of graduation, I saw advertisement for Wingate. Um, she had mentioned it to me before. Um, I'd actually thought about applying there for a different position um, about a year or so earlier, and I was like, you know, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Nothing can't, can't hurt, so I applied. I remember this Vividly, I went, graduated, we, we both walked at the same time, we went down to Orlando to, you know, vacation, and I get a call from uh, Dr. Jay Wilder, and uh, he's like, you know, interested in, in bringing you up here, came up here, interviewed, got offered the job the same day, and the rest is history. The rest so, is history. Yeah, it definitely wasn't planned, but it ended up working out for the best, definitely. And when you start having those kids, the grandparents will be really close by. Believe well, me, that'll be helpful. Yeah, one, one, one half definitely will be close by. My parents yeah. are still in California, and my mom isn't looking forward to that. But yeah, her family is definitely here, and um, they'll, they're looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's, uh, let's take a break right here, Patrick. When we come back, we'll have the second half of our interview with Dr. Patrick Young, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Wingate University. Join us then. Hello, I'm Dr. Regina Benjamin, U.S. Surgeon General. As a family physician, I know that living with a long-term health problem such as diabetes, high blood pressure, or asthma is not easy. But patients who take control of their own health can live a long and full life. Talk to your doctor to understand your health condition and what you can do to manage it. Don't put your future at risk. Take your medication as directed. Learn more at scripturefuture.org. Welcome back to the second part of our interview with Dr. Patrick Young, Assistant Professor of Psychology at Wingate University. I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Pe Professor of Political Science. And now uh, we've returned from Tallahassee. We're now in Wingate, North Carolina. You've been offered the job as, at first, a visiting Assistant Professor of Psychology. Right. So what, is, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that mean? Um, you're on a short leash, I guess. <laughs> uh, it just means they were, well, uh, basically they were in a state of transition. Uh, Wingate was uh, within the psychology department. They had two professors leave unexpectedly, uh, which put them in a bind, and they needed someone. They didn't, they weren't aware if they would have the funding for a full-time position, but yet they didn't want an adjunct per se. So basically what I did was I came in and uh, helped them out, took over these courses. Like I said before, you know, literally getting hired two or three days before you know, faculty orientation. So um, very quick turnaround, uh, came back up, just, just myself and some clothes, went through the faculty orientation, started to get the material for the course, so started to go over it. And that weekend, went back down to Tallahassee, loaded up the U-Haul, came up, and then started school. 
like that next Monday or Tuesday. So it was very, very quick. Um, and again, just kind of me basically filling in for this one particular faculty, faculty member who left, um, kind of with short notice, and, and I was able to help him out with that. Sure. And a year later, uh, essentially a year later, you reapply for the full-time position, you interview it, you get that job, now you're a tenure stream assistant professor of psychology. Yeah, um, they ended up having, you know, like acquiring the funding for, to basically to transition the visiting into a, a full-time assistant professor uh, position, so I applied just like everyone else, went through that process. Uh, luckily, they, they liked how it went, I guess, the first semester or so, got some good evaluations. And they decided to, to keep me on. And this year, lost the visiting part, just assistant uh, professor, like you said, tenure track. And uh, what's nice is that last year will still count. It counts, counts as far as uh, uh, progress towards tenure. And um, yeah, it's, things have been going great. Good, good. Let's start out with the teaching part. Uh, you do some very interesting research, but I, I want to start with the teaching part. Um, what is it that a psychologist, can I call you a psychologist, I guess? Do, uh, what what I, kind of psychology professor, what is your obligation or your job or your duty to the students in a, in a psychology class? What are you trying to convey to them? Well, I think it really de it depends on where you're at, what institution you're at. For Wingate University, it's definitely uh, much, much more of an emphasis on teaching. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a, it's a teaching institute, so it's not focused on our research. So my job, the way I, I look at it and my perspective is on it, is that I'm, I'm trying to get these students to really, one, be interested in psychology, which you know a lot are to begin with. They're not really sure why they're interested, but they just say hey, it's kind of fun or interesting, or I saw a movie and hey, I'll check it out. So trying to you know take that interest and, and keep it going, um, give them the basics as far as what psychology is, what we're studying, how we can use it to learn more about people, you know, as far as behavior, you know, overt behavior, nonverbal communication, these types of things, you know, your thought process, solving problems, um, influence of the situation on people, you know, in terms of uh, how peer pressure can play a role or why do people conform or give in to authority. Um, these types of things, memory, learning, theories. Um, so all these different aspects of psychology, I'm just trying to hopefully put them out there in an enjoyable way for the students, try and get them interested, uh, and to challenge them, you know, challenge them to, to think, think critically, uh, analyze things, read, um, ask questions, you know, don't just take things for face value, but really critically analyze it and think, think for, your, for yourself. Um, and those are, those are the main things I'm trying to get out. And, it, and I do it in different ways for different classes, but generally speaking, I'd say that that's, that's what I'm shooting for, and hopefully I'm getting at least close to that. Sure. In a sentence or two, what, what is it that psychology studies? Uh, studies behavior, studies thoughts, and studies how you respond to physiological sensations, basically. And how these are all inter, intertwined, you know? We usually we only, th we only think about what we can what we see people do, overt behavior, obviously. Right. So we learn more about that. We can't see your thoughts, but we try and still learn about it and, and see what things can influence or affect those thoughts. And how you feel, physiologically, sensations. You know, a lot of, one of the things that's interesting about psychology to me is that if you're talking about emotions, and I know this is way more than one sentence, but your, how your body feels is usually pretty much the same for a lot of different emotions. We just label them different, mm. you know, and that label comes from our thoughts about how our body feels and also kind of getting feedback from our behavior. So it's, to me, psychology is looking at all three of those aspects, what you, what you think, how you behave, how your body feels, and how each of those things can influence each other. Sure. And I, I guess with the physiological part, you might hear someone say something like, I felt really guilty. And I imagine that is both kind of a mental thing, but is there physiological, I mean, can you feel guilty? Well, sure, I mean, if it's all about how you praise it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure that person's feeling of guilt was probably similar to how that person f feels when they're afraid, mm -hmm. or perhaps when um, they're scared. You know, if, I mean, I'm just I'm assuming that maybe they had some butterflies, maybe they're sweating perhaps. Right. Right, and, and we sometimes get butterflies and sweat when we're happy, right? Mm. Depending upon what situation we're in. 
Right. One of the um, analogies I try to make with my students is that, you know, you're getting ready to go on a roller coaster down at Carowinds, mm -hmm. you might be, your heart might, start, heart might start racing, you might start sweating, right? You might have butterflies. That's exactly the way you, you'd feel if you're probably walking down a dark alley mm. and you hear something behind you. You just right. label it two different things. One's excitement, one's perhaps, I'm afraid. So. Sure. So your particular emphasis is in sports psychology. Yes. And you had said previously that there weren't that many places in the country that had, that had this specialty or this emphasis. So what, what does sports psychology do? I, mean, I guess it applies the principle of psychology to sports, but what, is, what does that mean? Well, there's, there's different ways you can look at it. And the way that I look at it and the way that Florida State's program was, was it's very, very much geared towards performance enhancement. Mm -hmm. How can you take, like you said, psychological principles and apply it to performers? Right? It could be an athlete, generally speaking it's athletes, but it could be a musician, uh, could be a public speaker, could be anyone doing a task. How, could you, what can, how can you use psychology to make this person better at it? Mm -hmm. um, that's really what sports psychology is trying to do. Uh, and then obviously, for the most part, within the domain of, of athletics. How can we make players better? How can we make coaches better? How can we make the communication between players and coaches better? Um, so that's what we try and focus in on in, on sports psychology. It's not sports psychology is not a psychologist dealing with an athlete who has maybe an eating disorder or say a psychological issue such as depression. That's not what what sports psychology is. You might find sports psychologists who also do that, who also have a clinical emphasis, but primarily it's individuals who are have an expertise in psychology, but yet you know, gear it towards making performers better. Okay. Let me mention briefly just a couple of things that any sports fan would want to know from a sports psychologist. Um, Scott Norwood lines up for a field goal <laughs> in the Super Bowl and he misses it wide right and everyone says he chokes. What does that mean? Well, well, is that true? I mean, I, with choking, choking under pressure, it really depends on who you are. I mean, because I would say that he probably didn't choke. I mean, because he missed the kick, right? Can you name me one, I'm gonna put you on the spot, can you name me one kicker at high school, college, professional football that's ever been completely accurate, 100% of the time? Not that I know of. Yeah, exactly, so you're gonna miss a kick. Right. Um, now, sometimes those kicks will come in situations where you don't wanna miss, right? Which is obviously the case you, 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 po you pointed out. Um, I mean, a, a choke is, pretty much defined as when you perform below your typical level of performing, mm -hmm. right? So you don't, you have your average level of performance and you perform underneath that based on how you perceive the situation. So a lot of times we like to see, we like to think of the athletes that go in, whether it's someone making a field goal for the game or someone shooting free throws at the mm -hmm. end of the game, mm -hmm. right? We assume that this person, because they are a professional athlete and they have all this training, that they're gonna make it every single time. But when you go up there and you see the graphic for the, say, the free throw shooter, you, you don't see 100% free throws. You, see, right. you might see 93%, Steve mm -hmm. Nash, perhaps. Yeah. Doesn't mean he's gonna make it every time. And just because he misses it within this one particular situation doesn't necessarily mean he, he's a choker, right? He's just, that's just how he is, you know? You give him 10 of those free throws, he'll probably make nine. Right. But if you have a small sample size, there's the opportunity for, for mm -hmm. what we would call failure. So. I think a lot of times people get caught up in this idea of choking and choking under pressure. And depending on who you talk to, some people say, yeah, this is something that happens. But others, in my personal point of view, is more like, let's just look at it as these things happen. And no one's perfect. We, as, or, and myself as a sports psychologist, can do the best we can to make sure that the number of these occurrences decreases. But you, you're never gonna have, they're not robots. You're not gonna get these people to go out there and perform at that high level each and every time but the public is, is fickle, you know, the mob sure. is fickle. So they want, they want you to perform at that high level each and every time, and if you don't, you're a choker. Yeah. I, I was gonna ask you another question about uh, sort of, sp I guess, sports psychology. Um, Brody Miller had trained and trained and trained and trained, uh, and then the, goes out, the, the Olympic skier, and then goes out and doesn't perform well, and he's not, not simply labeled a choker, he was labeled as almost being non-committed to, to the goal. And I wonder if, if there is that component as well, where it's not maybe a performance issue, but uh, you know, are there, I guess, are there some sports 
where it's not the mental aspect, but there's just talent and, and uh, a skill set involved that's really difficult to replicate over time, you know? Well, you, you, bring, up a, you bring up a couple of different things. With Brody Miller, um, and I don't know too much about him as an individual, but I, I am familiar with, with this particular situation. There was a lot of people at that time who, and I, and I think this is, might be a perception of professional skiers, who don't see the Olympics as being that big of a deal. You know, and he still oh, performed very, very high in terms of placing in other competitions within that same period of time. And you know, it's possible that, yeah, maybe he wasn't as motivated as he should have been. It's also possible that maybe he was under too much pressure. Maybe he felt pressure because he was expected to perform and he internalized it and maybe he tried to cope with it by lacking preparation, perhaps. It's hard to say. Um, but I do remember he, people came out and said that. Is the, when you bring up talent, though, that's a huge area of debate in sports psychology. The whole idea of talent versus practice. You know, mm -hmm. Are there people born this way? Right? They have this God-given talent, right? They're just cold-blooded you know, assassins on the field. Yeah, or are, is, it just, is, there, is this success a result of practice? Or is it a little bit of both? You know, and you'll find researchers who are on either end of the continuum and some who are in the middle. Um, you know, there's one by the name of Gagne who's all about talent. You know, it's all about, hey, we can go and we can show you different people and uh, look at their genes and all this stuff, and it's, it's just talent. And then there's another prominent researcher, Anders Ericsson, who coincidentally is at Florida State, who's the, the expert on expertise, and he says, no, it's obviously talent has something to do with it, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna be, your genetic makeup is gonna make you perhaps more likely to succeed, but you still gotta practice, right? You still have to put forth the effort. And you, I mean, you see this when you look at professional athletes. There are athletes in all different types of professional leagues where there's people who are just raw physical specimens, spe specimens, excuse me. And you would assume that they're going to be the best ever, you know? Like, there's no, there should be no reason why they're not dominating, but yet they don't because they don't work at it because they just assume that, hey, I'm bigger, I'm stronger. And that works to a point, but when you get to elite levels, professional levels, it takes more of that. You have to develop your mental game as well. Right. No one's going to be a power forward in the NBA if they're 5'11". But, but just being 6'8 is not the only thing that enables you to be a power forward. Exactly. And vice versa. Most people who are 5'5 five, five and 5'6 five, don't make the NBA. But there's a perfect example right here from Charlotte, Muggsy Bogues. Sure. Who practiced, who worked. Right. Played at Wake Forest, coincidentally, I think. Uh, did he? I believe he did. <laughs> uh, Patrick, thanks for this stimulating conversation today. I'm glad you could join us here on Winget Spotlight. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm Joseph Ellis, Assistant Professor of Political Science. Uh, we are joined today by Dr. Patrick Young. Uh, assistant Professor of Psychology at Wingate. Uh, next week we will have Dr. Ebony Stringer, uh, criminologist uh, who just recently joined us about a month ago here at Wingate. Hope you can join us then. Thank you for watching.